Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. <clears throat> find it, then let me say a couple of things, and then we will read together. Glad to see you here tonight. It's good to see you in the service. It's good to be here with you. I belong to Cumberland Hills Baptist Church. It's a church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. It's just four years old, and uh, it was started by, uh, well, actually several men, and Richard Coyle, who pastors the church, and all of these men and Pastor Coyle are friends with your pastor. So uh, our church supports the ministry down here at Miami Beach and, and the ministry uh, here with the churches. Uh, there was a vote on it in our church, and uh, I was outvoted, so we, <laughs> we support uh, the, <laughs> the work here. I said to Will, uh, coming over, I think it was this morning, now, have you been in the new uh, facility for the church? No, he said he can. You know, when you rent it over, he had been there, but he'd not been here. And I said, well, it really is neat. I said, it's kind of tucked back in place. But I said, it's very, now forgive me, because, uh, well, let me just say it. I said, it's very Ryan Price. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's just something he fixed up, and it works, and it's very nice. And when we came in, the fences knew, I like that. And it looks to me like you've sealed the uh, pavement out there since I've been here. And there's been some stuff inside that's really nice. And I'm serious about that. I really appreciate it, appreciate it much. I don't remember when I first met your pastor, but it's been um, several years ago. It may have been when he was still in school. Would it have been pastor or was it after? I met you, but you wouldn't remember. I didn't remember, yeah. yeah. You were just a kid then. Okay. <laughs> you met me, but I didn't meet you at the time. But I've known him for several years. He we appreciate them very much. Thank God for them. Didn't you enjoy the service this morning? Amen. Amen. I thought that was great. Um, I learned something this morning. I told people at lunch, which would be Will and Zena and Weston and Mary, I said, I learned something this morning. And I really did. I learned something in the service. So I said, Weston, what did I learn? Well, he wasn't sure. Mary, what did I learn? She didn't know. Nobody else. I said, well, I learned the definition of a word. And Mary said, conscience. Do you remember that this morning? I, that was a help to me because I knew that different people might have consciences that are different. But the whole idea this morning was you're conscious, you're informed. You're what you think about um, in your mind should be informed with the scripture, should it not? Mm -hmm. So that was a help. Now, I'm going to preach that at some point in the future. And the wonderful thing is when you are 76 and you have a 47-year-old son, you can steal anything from him and nobody knows it. See, they, they will always think he got it from me. And so, uh, for example, you know, when somebody asks you to sign their Bible so they can remember to pray for you, you usually put your name and then a verse. And sometimes people will say, put your favorite verse under. You've seen that, haven't you? Well, when Will signs a Bible, he puts the verse first, and then he puts his name in it. Well, I saw that, but that is really, that's great. That's the way it should be done. It makes sense, doesn't it? So you put the verse first and your name under it. So I do that now. So there are people all over this country, and they, they see Will's signature, and, you know, the verse is first and his name is second. They say, I know where he got that. <laughs> of course, I don't tell him any different. <laughs> I know we're well got it too, but I, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. So, so I'm going to preach on conscience, and uh, people will never have heard it before, especially the way I preach it. <laughs> um, so, but it was great. I enjoyed the service this morning. It was great. Thank you for giving to Campership. I have no idea what you've given, but I appreciate it more than you know. And you know, it means a lot to come to the church and see. Um, and the information given out in the church and even on the video, uh, an appeal for campership for the Bell Rice Ranch. This is wonderful. Mary and I have done this, I don't know now, maybe 15 years. 
Um, I think we're going to be in 17 churches at this campership trip. We call it the Florida trip. And uh, uh, we brought a lot of people down here and so on. But yeah. the, uh, the expenses had to come out of the offering. Well, three years ago, we changed that. Well, he gave a gift to the ranch, and that started me thinking this way. And so now, every dime that comes in the campership offering goes to campership. It doesn't pay for fuel, doesn't pay for food, doesn't take care of anything. Uh, Will is independently wealthy okay. anyway. He doesn't need any money. And if Mary or I need any, we can always ask Will. Uh, we won't get any, but we can always ask Will. So, uh, our way has been taken care of, seriously, and so that every dime that's given goes directly to the ranch for campership. Now, to me, that's a big deal. I think that's thrilling. So if uh, we were joking about uh, $40,000 and the $20,000, but if you gave $225, that's the approximate cost for one deaf camper. That's where we come up with the amount. If you gave $225, you would pay a way to camp of one deaf camper. But if you gave $2.25, it would still all go to campership. So whether you gave $2.25 or more or less, it all goes to help make it possible for deaf young people. And I think this summer is our 67th summer, maybe 68th. I always get confused. Uh, 53, 63, 73, 83, 93, 103, 113, that's 60, you have to figure out the rest, but you have to remember that it's one more year, because the first year, zero, we had campers. Does this make sense? Probably doesn't, but at any rate, it's been 67 years, or 68. Dad began the ranch in 53, he and mother, Mary and I had it from, uh, Let's see, 78 to 93, and Will is now in his 16th year. Can you believe that? Will is in his 16th year of directing the ministries of the ranch. So we appreciate that. How, how many of you folks have been to the ranch? That's wonderful. That's just great. That is wonderful. I'm very thankful for it. We're going to be here this week. Will preaches here um, Wednesday night, and I said to the pastor this morning, um, I'm coming to the chili cook-off. Well, he said, you are? Yeah. He said, well, hey, would you like to give a 10-minute presentation of the gospel? Well, sure. So I'm coming. This afternoon, Mary said, you know what? She said, I'm going to fix chili for the cook-off. Then she caught herself. No, 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 no. She said, you'll be making chili for the cook-off because the pastor said this morning, you're not a man unless you can make chili. And I can't. So Mary's going to teach me this week. Actually, we're going to borrow some of Will's Wendy's chili <laughs> and put a hot pepper in. So we'll be here. And that's 5.30, isn't it? Saturday yes, night, 5.30. And you know, it really will be wonderful. I love things like this. You just fellowship, have chili, have fun, and then take 10 minutes to show people how they can know they're going to have it. That's important. And I believe this. I believe that people can be saved because there will be people invited by you who want to know the Lord that will come. And that being the case, we can see people trust the Lord Jesus. So, I'm looking forward to that. And I've taken a long time just to visit tonight. But, um, um, yeah, I think I'm finished. I think I'm finished visiting. I'm only going to preach for an hour and 15 minutes and so we have plenty of time. But no, I have to make it shorter than that. They close 595 at 10 o'clock tonight. So I have to be out of here by at least a quarter to the <laughs> So we can make it to 595 and get back home where we're staying. All right? You got your Bibles open to Hebrews chapter 5. I normally like to stand when we read, but I'm going to ask you to remain seated tonight. And let's start with verse 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. That is, the first principles of God's speaking, which would be Scripture. And are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. 
For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Father, uh, help us to see this tonight. Help us to understand it. May it be an encouragement and a blessing to us. And may it have a part in our growth, I pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Uh, have you ever noticed that we preachers often say things that you already know? You've noticed that, haven't you? We say things that you already know. In fact, we say things that everybody probably should know. It's a little bit like announcements. I've always been tickled at announcements. This has, for the longest time, this has amused me. A pastor gets up and says, now don't forget the service tonight at 6 o'clock. As if anyone would. I mean, nobody goes to church, I think not, unless he's a guest or visitor, and here's now don't forget the service tonight at 6 o'clock, and then says to himself, that's a great idea. They have two of them. Wow. They have a service tonight at 6. Or the pastor will say, now Wednesday night, don't forget the 7 o'clock prayer meeting service. Now, I, I understand that in making announcements, we need to repeat because we need to uh, be sure that we know about what's going on. The reason I know about the chili cook-off is because twice this morning in Sunday school and then in church, or maybe it was twice in church, the pastor mentioned it. So it is true, but you know, when you need to hear something more than once, it may mean that you didn't learn it the first time. Now, we've also been told that repetition aids learning. So hearing something and again and again and again helps us to know it. So what is the Bible talking about here when it says, you know, when you should be yourself teachers, you have need that one teach you, which be the first or principles of the oracles of God. So what, that's funny, he's following me with the TV, the camera here. I'm going down to get my wife the keys, and he has it so that for all of history, people will know. It's all right. Uh, so the Bible says here, when, when you should be teaching other people, you need to learn it again. You need to learn things that are the principles, uh, first principles of the oracles of God. And then he says, you're, you're like a babe that needs milk, and you don't take meat. And you know, you need to grow up, and you need to be able to have meat. Now, what is the Bible illustrating with these two food groups, milk and meat? Well, here's what we often hear, and this is incorrect, so don't amen me in the middle of this. <laughs> milk would be the simpler things of Scripture, like John 3:16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's the milk. But the meat of the Word of God would be the more difficult passages, like the book of of the revelation so and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire and this is the second death what what does that mean and so and so you have the deeper truths of the scriptures like one would find in the book of the revelation are um, in Ezekiel and is you know prophecy the books that deal with prophecy and not just the simple things, the milk of the Word of God, uh, like John 3.16. Now, that's not correct. And there are several reasons you can know that. The main one is, and we'll get to this in a second, it's the passage says uh, what is correct. But one, one way you can know that is, I could say that there are no simple parts of Scripture. There are just parts of Scripture that we know better than other parts. You know, anything becomes more simple when you learn it, doesn't it? Remember when you went to school and they said, now we're going to have a times table, and 6 times 8 is 48, and you went, oh my goodness, the times table, 6 times 8 is 48, that's just really terrible, until you were in school for 4 or 5 or 6 or 8 or 10 years, and then you were able to remember that 6 times 8 is 48, and it was simple, right? It's like spelling. I cannot spell. I cannot spell. I, I'm not stupid. Maybe close. <laughs> but 
I can't spell. Spelling doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense. Nothing is spelled the way it should be spelled. How do you spell slay? As in Santa's slay. Doesn't that have an E-I-G-H in it? Okay, why don't you spell pray? P-R-E-I-G-H. <laughs> to me, it is. And so I never, that's the truth. I don't know. And I can, I can be writing a letter, and I can spell a word once, and two paragraphs later, I say to myself, <laughs> how do you spell the word? Now, it's not that some words are harder than others. I, I pretty much got cat down. <laughs> K-A-T. I pretty much know cat. But most other words do bother me. So sometimes people think that the milk of the Word of God would be the more simple and the meat of the Word of God would be more <coughs> complex. The fact of the matter is that salvation by grace through faith, it could be argued, is very complex. Now, we all know how to be saved, and anybody can be saved, and even a child can come to the Lord Jesus. In fact, if you're going to come to the Lord Jesus, you need to come as a child. That is in complete faith, believing what the Bible says. But, um, you know, uh, salvation by grace through faith can get fairly deep. So, it's not saying that John 3.16 is milk, the book of the Revelation is meat. So, what is it saying? Well, if you'll forgive me, let's just go through this, all right? The milk of the Bible is the data, or the data. Not only can I not spell, I cannot pronounce words correctly. So if you say data, that's fine, or data. The data of Scripture, the information of Scripture, the input of Scripture, the, um, the specifics of Scripture, that's the milk of the Word of God. All right, what is the meat? The meat of the Word of God is taking the milk and putting it to use. That's why it says here, even by reason of use, they have exercised their minds to discern both good and evil. So it's talking about doing what you've learned in the Bible. Remember that the apostle in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, said those things which you have seen and heard and um, one other word in me. You, you've seen them, you've heard them in me. Do, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding should keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So it's one thing to see the Bible and to memorize or learn specific things about the Bible, but the meat of the Word of God is when you can live it. And the reason some people need to be taught the same things over and over again is because they forget them, and the reason they forget them is because they don't do them. They don't exercise their faith, and they're not exercising those things which they've learned in the Scripture to be right. Now, is this making sense? You're following me here? <clears throat> the meat of the Scripture is when you learn something in the Bible and do it. So you live by it, and in living by it, you, you can yourself become a teacher. Uh, do we have any school teachers here tonight? Anybody here teach? Your own kids, whatever? Okay, fine. All right. Well, Mary taught our children K, K4, K5, K4 through 12. And I often said to Mary, sometimes tongue in cheek, you know, you're having taught our three kids for these uh, be 12, 13, 14 years, you're having taught them would be equal to a master's degree in a college or maybe a doctorate, and that's true, because she taught it and taught it, and in order to teach it, she had to understand it herself. You know, if you teach something, then you've got it. If you can explain something to somebody else, then you understand it yourself. Okay, so how do you understand the Bible? You do what it says. You do it, just like the apostle said in Philippians 4, when he said these things do. Okay, when you do those things, then the peace of God becomes real to you. Let me give you a couple examples in Scripture. This is important. Proverbs 16.3, commit thy works unto the Lord, 
and thy thoughts shall be established. Now listen to the verse. You commit, or you roll off, or you give God your works. In other words, you do what God wants you to do, and your thoughts are established. Just like Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church was one day established, or Cumberland Hills Baptist Church was one day established, so your thoughts will be established, they will be built, if you commit your works to the Lord. So, I've always said, you do what's right, and you'll know what's right. Um, uh, somebody says, well, don't you have to know what's right to do what's right? You just need to obey the scriptures. And when you obey the Bible and you do what's right, you'll know what's right. Let me give you another example. David went at the request of his father to take some sandwiches and nourishment to his brothers. Remember they were in a battle, or at least David thought they were. So David goes to see his brothers, and when he gets to this valley, I always think of a football stadium. Um, and you have the two sides of the stadium. It was a valley, so it would have looked something like that. Down at the middle is a giant of a man, and he is taunting the Israelites. Send me a man, he says, to do battle with me. If he defeats me, we'll be your servants. If I defeat him, you'll be our servants. By the way, a boast or a pledge Goliath made which he could not and did not keep because he was defeated but in his defeat he he died he bought the farm and so there was no way that the enemies of Israel were going to become their slaves they ran remember that and when they ran the Israelites chased them. okay so David is just a boy some think he was 16 or 17 and he went to this, and he saw this, and he, and he goes to his brothers, and he says, somebody should do something about this, this braggart down there. Somebody should take care of this guy. You know, by the way, I wasn't there, but I've always thought this is the way it should have been handled. When Goliath said, send me a man, I think somebody should have stood up and said, we'll do better than that. We'll send you a hundred. Mm -hmm. And then just take the hundred guys down there and off Goliath, and it would have been over. But then we wouldn't have had the story. So David said, Shouldn't something be done? And his brothers basically said, well, why don't you do something? And David said, well, I don't have to be home for another two hours. I'll just take care of it while I'm here. Something like that. And so you remember the story. Uh, they, said, they said to David, David, you, you can't go against this man. You Now listen to this. You are but a youth, and he a warrior from his youth. David said, doesn't make any difference. I'm ready. You're ready? Yeah, I can, I can take care of this. Uh, how, how can you take care of this? And David said, well, when I kept my dad's sheep, remember the story? Lion came in. I took care of the lion. A bear came in. I took care of the bear. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as they were. Okay, David did what he was supposed to do when he was supposed to do it. And so he understood how to take care of Goliath when nobody else did. That just amazes me. Everybody was saying, how can we do this guy's nine feet, maybe 10 feet tall? Probably weighed 500 pounds. Um, and if he was in good trim, he probably weighed that. He was literally a giant of a man and an entire army <clears throat> was saying, how in the world can we take care of this? And David said, well, wait a minute. The lion was big, yeah, I took care of him. The bear was big, yeah, I took care of him. I know how to take care of Goliath, and he did. And not only did he know how to, but he did it. See, when you hear, you need to come to the chili cook-off. You know, if you'd come and if you'd bring somebody, we'd see people say, that's one thing. But when you do it, it will really, forgive my English, grow your life. Christ. It'll really make a difference. See, when you do what you're supposed to do. So you've got uh, Proverbs 16.3, you have David and Goliath. You have basically every prophet of God or every man of God in the Old Testament who obeyed what God said and did what God said and then became himself an example of one who eats meat and not milk. Now let me give you two quick examples and our time will be over, alright? 
that are right. Okay, two good examples. <clears throat> Number one, uh, giving will always be a battle for you until you simply start doing it. Mm -hmm. Here's what the Bible says. I love Luke 6.38. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed together and shaken um, and, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom? For with the same measure that you meet, with all it shall be measured unto you again. Now that passage says, if I give, uh, that God will give back. Now, I know what a lot of people say. They say, Bill, are you, are you preaching health and wealth theology? No, no, I'm preaching the Bible. What the Bible says is, if you will be a giver, God will take care of you. And I've often said this, if a man is a giver and he gives, and God gives back to him, what will he do with that which God gives back? Now, stop and think about this. If a man is a giver and he believes that God will give back to him, and so he gives, and God does keep his promise and does give back, what will the giver do with that which God gave him? Give more. And the answer is give. Sure. So I've often said, uh, if you've ever wanted to give, but you felt like you couldn't give, the reason you couldn't give is because you didn't give. But if you would give, then you could give. Is that confusing? It may be, but it's really on target. I'll tell you people. Um, here's the way Will says it. <clears throat> See, I have to give Will credit because he's here. <laughs> uh, but here's the way Will says it. I love this. Now listen to this. The giver will always be able to. The giver will always be able to what? Give. Okay. And the reason the giver will always be able to give is because he gives. And so he sees that. And not only has he heard something, uh, from the Bible, or maybe in a Bible class or in a Bible uh, lesson, but he's living it, and so he now knows it, and doesn't have to be taught it again. Now, he won't mind hearing about giving. When you go to church and you hear something that you've heard before, or that you know you, you still are blessed by it, are you not? Amen. So it never bothers me. Um, but you know what? Um, a person who lives a life of giving really understands it. And somebody says, you know, I, I, think, I think you give too much. Does it phase him? See, because he <coughs> understands giving. Number two. I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but this is important, so I want to mention. Church attendance. It's, you know, just coming to church. Now, church attendance is not everything in the Christian life, but it is very important. I noticed this morning, by the way, that after the service, nobody left. I thought about going to the pastor and saying, uh, Pastor, these people realize that the service is over. <laughs> people just stayed here and stayed. And, were you here this morning? They just stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed and stayed. And stayed. In fact, people stayed so long that I thought it might be a good idea to take another offering. <laughs> um, we, didn't, we didn't do that. But you know, I think that's a healthy thing. I don't think you have to stay in church after the service for a set amount of time, but I think if you want to, that's good. And you know why it's good? Because you're fulfilling the purpose of meeting at church. If you ever had somebody say to you, you know, I can worship God on a fishing boat in the Keys as easily as I can worship God in a church. Did you know that may be true? Can you worship God in nature? Yes. Don't you think? You know, next Sunday, let's just all go to the Keys and go fishing. All right. Well, could, could one worship God out in nature or appreciate God? Of course. But worshiping God is not the only reason that one comes to church. In fact, I, I might even say I want to be careful about this, but it may not even be the main reason. Well, why do you come to church? Well, Hebrews 10 says it this way. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Isn't this interesting? In the first century, there were some people who skipped church. Now we think everybody went to church when... Uh, 
the book of Hebrews was being written, but that's not true. So uh, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and especially the passage goes on to say, as we see the day approaching. I think the day approaching there is the destruction of Jerusalem, and you Bible scholars can argue about this later. But that's what I think they're talking about. You know, what Jesus prophesied is going to come to pass soon. We need to be careful to be in church. All right, but why? Well, the previous verse says this, that we're to be in church to stir up. The word used there is provoke. To provoke one another unto love and good works. So one of the things that a church does is God's people who are blessed or who are encouraged or who are helped always help God's people who need to be encouraged or blessed or helped. And see, that happens in church. It's, it's you, you come to church, you sit, you hear the Bible preach, that's very important, and you learn things, and you apply things in your life, but you help other people. That's why we give invitations. Uh, could you make a decision in your seat after hearing a Bible message preach, could you? Sure. In fact, have you ever done that? Have you ever made a significant decision where you were sitting and you didn't, quote, go forward, quote, close, or you didn't necessarily tell anybody after the service, but it was it was significant that that ever happened to you? Yeah, you know why? Because decisions don't happen in a geographical location. Decisions happen in you. All right, so why would we ever have anybody come forward? Well, there are two good reasons. One is, you know, to help them, encourage them, uh, counsel them. Uh, that's one good reason. But the other reason is just to encourage God's people. Have you ever heard this prayer? I, I literally detest this prayer. <laughs> I just It just bugs me no end. God, we know there were decisions tonight. Even though they were not visible, we thank thee for the decisions that people evidently made and kept a secret where they are sitting. All right, it's not wrong to make a decision where you sit, and it's not wrong necessarily not to be public about it. That's not necessarily wrong, but when you are public about it, you encourage other people. What's the word testimony mean? <coughs> it means to tell what you know. When you testify, you tell what you know. At the chili cook-off this weekend, if I if I heard it correctly, we're going to have testimonies, and people are going to stand up and say, you know, uh, this is me. When I was four years old, my mother showed me that I could know my sins were forgiven and know that I was on my heaven, uh, my way to heaven, by putting my trust and faith in Christ, by believing what He said, and by trusting Him for salvation. Okay, well, why why does the pastor want? several people to give their salvation testimonies because he wants people to be encouraged by it. He wants believers to be encouraged by it. He wants people who come who have not the foggiest notion as to whether or not they're going to heaven to see that they can know it. See? So a public testimony or a public stand or a public going forward can be a help other people. Have you ever heard anybody say this? You know that was so clear tonight, I don't know why a hundred people didn't go forward. Have you ever heard that? Whenever anybody says that to me, now please don't think this is unkind. It is. But don't think it is. <laughs> people say to me, you know, I, I just don't understand why a hundred people didn't go forward tonight. And I always say, well, did you? Hmm. Well, normally <laughs> The answer is no. So I think that would be all right, wouldn't it? I mean, he would have had a good reason for not going forward. Maybe 99 other people did. But sometimes it's good just to go forward to be an encouragement to people. Now, I don't think we should overdo it. I was preaching at church recently. Over my left, there were maybe 15 or 20. I don't know, there weren't that many. Eight. 15. Teenagers. I love it when teenagers are in a church. And they were pretty 
uh, rambunctious in the song service. In fact, I was worried because I was going to preach, and I thought, you know, I wonder if I'm going to have trouble with these kids. But when I get up to preach, they listen just intently. And um, when the invitation was given, I don't know, I would say six or eight of them came forward and knelt um, at the front and uh, evidently prayed and then went back to their seats. The only problem is there was nothing to come forward over. There's, there was no reason to come forward. I, I, I preached on preaching. And I was explaining to people what preaching is so that they would know, so that they would, um, you know, respond to preaching. And I, in the invitation, I said, how many of you have said, you know, after we've looked at 2 Timothy 4.2 tonight, God's helped me to see uh, that I need to have a different kind of reaction to preaching. And there were three, four, five people raised their hand. None of the teams did. They raised their hand. Okay, did they make decisions? Okay, anything else need to be done? No, unless you want to encourage people. So I could have said, okay, you people that raised your hand and encouraged people and come to the front, but I didn't. And the pastor got up and said a few words, and they had a song, and these kids all came forward. Now, what they go forward for? I don't have any idea. Do you? No. I don't think it's wrong to went forward. I'm just saying I don't know that it encouraged anybody. Are you following this? Mm -hmm. See, so the deal is, one of the reasons we meet in a local church is to stir up one another and to love and good works. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but you should be here. You should be here. Uh, you know, I was really hurt by this. Do you realize that there were more people here this morning to hear Will preach <laughs> than here tonight? To hear me preach, did you know that? that is that disturbing or what? <laughs> Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. There, 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 there are some good reasons. Some people don't drive at night, unless they're going to a bar or something, but they don't, <laughs> they don't drive to church. I'm sorry, I'm just being funny. Some people don't drive at night because they don't see as well at night, and so some people don't drive at night. Sometimes distance, they get help or ride in the morning. There were several who came on the bus this morning, and the bus didn't run tonight, so they didn't come back. So there can be good reasons, but the point I'm making is it's one thing to hear about being in church, it's another thing to be there. And when you be there and go there and do that, then you understand. See? This morning in the message we heard um, about <clears throat> the way we're to live our lives and there were three points. I wish I could remember them. They were really good. <laughs> they were life-changing points. But anyway, um, we, we heard about amazing government. And we heard about the matter of fear. And we heard about the matter of love and doing what's right because um, you love people. What was the point to It's going to bug me. Conscience. What? Conscience. Conscience. Didn't I just mention that earlier? <laughs> I'll never forget about conscience. I just forgot about it. <laughs> Well, that's great, but what you need to do is go home and start putting all those things in practice. If you have a wife that can help you remember what they were, you can go home and say, okay, my relationship to those in authority, my relationship in light of my conscience, and my relationship in light of loving other people. And when you do that, then it just, it opens up, it makes sense, it's real, and, and you can live it. Okay. Remember when you first learned to drive? I'll tell you this we'll about the prayer. When I was nine years old, I helped my dad uh, tear up an old house down. <clears throat> my job was to tear down the chimney. And I've always been good at tearing things down. I've never <laughs> learned how to build anything, but I can tear things down. So I helped dad. And I was nine, and my, we was on the ranch. There was this little house. And dad said to me, he knew how to work a crowd, so to speak. He said, you know, Bill, you've really done a good job today. He said, you've done a good job. And he said, I'm going to do something really nice that you're going to appreciate because you did such a good job. So after work, we got in this old 1949 Willis Jeep pickup truck um, that we owned then. If I still had that truck, it'd be worth 
a million dollars today, but it was worth probably 400 at the time. It had three speed on the column. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay, and a clutch. All right. So Dad took me out in a field. When you come to the ranch, when you drive into the ranch, you look to the field at the right. That's the Bill Rice the third learning how to drive the field. All right. So we got the field. He said, "Okay, son, put it in neutral. Think of an H on its side. You've got reverse, first gear, second gear, and third gear." And put it in neutral, that's right in the middle, okay. And put your foot on the clutch. And then start. So then I started. He said, okay, now put it in first gear. All right, and I said, let your foot off the clutch slowly and the truck will start. Well, you know what happened. You know what happened. I let my foot off the clutch too quick and the truck died. <laughs> it died. Okay, we tried it a second time, a third time, a fourth time. My dad uh, was very patient about this. And he said, okay, put your foot on the clutch. And then when I learned the first night how to get it going and low, then the second night we got the second gear. And the third night, uh, third gear, but we really weren't going fast enough for that. But I learned to drive. And I, had, I was very concentrated. I had to think, okay, all right, let's see, clutch in, first gear, clutch out. Um, no, more gas, more gas. Okay, fine, now clutch in, second gear. Now clutch out, now clutch in, third gear, uh, now clutch out. How many of you people can drive a stick? That's what I'm thinking. That's <laughs> wow. Only about half of the drivers here tonight. I think everybody should learn how to drive a stick shift. The car I currently own has six speeds. It's just great. It's just great. I just love shifting. I love up shifting and down shifting. And I never think about it. This car, <laughs> I hope it's all right to say this, this car has 435 horsepower, and um, you put it in first gear, and when you want it to go, it goes, and then you shift to second, and then the third, and then the fourth, and then the fifth, and then the sixth. You say, how fast does it go in sixth gear? Well, I know it goes 55, because I've had it there <laughs> many, many times. You say, does it go any faster than that? I don't know, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you about it. <laughs> right, so, so I don't think about it. You know, I don't think, oh my goodness, I want to downshift. Let me see, it's in uh, fifth gear. All right, so I'm going to pull it toward the uh, foot on the clutch, pull it. Uh, it's just all automatic. You know how I learned to drive like that? Well, I got a book, and I memorized it. And I forgot some of it, so I memorized it again. And then I forgot some of it, and so then I remember. And then I taught other people from the book. Is that how I learned to drive? No, I learned to drive by driving. And you'll learn about giving by giving. And you'll learn about the importance of church by going. And you'll learn about prayer by praying. You'll learn about um, understanding Bible truths by reading. There are just so many things. When you get into the meat of the word, which comes to you by reason of use, when you use the Bible, then you know the Bible is bound for prayer. Now, I'm not going to have a come forward invitation tonight, um, and I think that's just fine, but I would like to ask a couple of questions, all right? I wonder if you're here tonight and you'd say, you know, Bill, as we were looking at Hebrews 5, God spoke to my heart about doing better in doing the things I already know about the Bible. God brought to my mind some areas where I need to do better. And with God's help and by God's grace, tonight's going to form a turning point in my life, and I'm, I'm going to do what God says to do. Let me repeat the question so it won't be confusing. How many people would say, Brother Bill, as we look at Hebrews 5, God spoke to my heart about doing things, getting into the meat of Bible truth by doing them. God brought to my mind some things I need to be doing, and you'd say, pray with me about that, please. Would you slip a hand up where you're seated? Well, wonderful. You can take your hands down. Any others? Any others? Well, that's just wonderful. I thank God for that. Father, help all of us to grow in grace by feasting on the meat of the Word of God and by reason of use, putting into practice things that we've heard or have seen to be true, I pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Pastor?
You are dismissed. We're, we're finished. See you. God bless you. Weston, do you feel validated for not liking spelling? Yeah. <laughs>